Welcome everybody. Uh, as you know, uh, we have many foreigners among our students too, and some people uh, attending online, including from the doctoral uh, seminar, international seminar that's taking place here at Catholic uh, Global School of Law. So we will do this session in English, but I wanted to start by thanking very much uh, Justice Luis Roberto Barroso for having accepted our invitation to come here and to come here in, in what is always a very special moment for us, perhaps the most special moment of the year for Catholic Global School of Law, that is our most distinguished lecture, a lecture that is honored, uh, named after Francisco Lucas Pires. And I want very much to thank again the family for being here, in particular Teresa, but all uh, the sons too. Thank you very much to the ambassador of Brazil. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for, for coming and being here with us. Thank you to Justice Gonçalo Almeida Ribeiro, Gonçalo, colleague, friend. Um, thank you to the colleagues that are here, to the students. Uh, it is really uh, a pleasure for us to welcome here Justice Luis Roberto Barroso, that has a very remarkable and distinguished career in law. Uh, he graduated in law by the University of Rio de Janeiro, but he also studied economics and management at the Pontificia Universidade of Rio de Janeiro. And I think that broad scope and that broad lens, including in approaching and analyzing legal issues, is still visible today. Um, is a Master of Laws by Yale Law School and has been a visiting scholar at Harvard and elected in many other universities, including in Brazil and abroad. He's been a lawyer, an attorney, in some of Brazil's most famous cases, while also being an established scholar, in particular in the field of constitutional law. In 2013, he was appointed to Brazil's Supreme Court, where he has also served as president of the Electoral Court and gained a reputation of staunch independence. A lawyer, a professor, a justice of the highest caliber. He brings together in all these three dimensions what we teach at Catholic Global School of Law. Thinking the law, advocating and arguing about the law, interpreting and adjudicating the law. But it's also a perfect fit for this lecture for other reasons. Some of them have to do with what he has in common with Francisco Lucas Pierce. He is, as Francisco Lucas Pierce was, a legal writer that merges a profound technical control of the law with an almost literary style of writing. He is also someone that is profoundly creative while remaining deeply loyal to the foundations of the law. And he has an approach to law and to the role that lawyers have to play that is embedded in a deeper understanding of the role of law in society and therefore requires an understanding of that society itself. Today's topic, the topic that he chose for today, I think it's a very good example of this approach to law. In that respect is also emblematic, if I say so, if I can say so, of the total law and contextual approach to the teaching and the study of law we adopt here at Catholic Global School of Law. And this, I have to say this, is one of the reasons why we hope, perhaps in the future, to have the benefit of having him teach our students too. <laughs> There I is hope not in exile, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> if necessary, yes, but I hope not. <laughs> I'm certain that will not be the case. There is no good lawyer that only knows the law. A good lawyer needs to understand sociology, economics, and political science, for example, just to name a few. But we don't train and we don't want sociologists, political scientists, or economists of the law. What we want and what we train is lawyers that understand, interpret, 
and apply better the law, since they know how to use the insights of the other disciplines to better understand both the mechanics of law and the context in which that law is born, was born, and the context in which it is to be applied. Luis Roberto Barroso, Justice Barroso, is an exemplary lawyer of this type. It's enough if you read, and I would strongly recommend you, some of his articles and judicial opinions. His understanding of the law and his practice of the law, arguing before adjudicating now, is enriched by the insights of his widespread knowledge of other areas and other disciplines. He is also therefore a lawyer and a judge that demonstrates how artificial is the boundary between practice and theory. There is no good practice that is not informed by theory, and there is no good theory that is falsified in practice. He knows this and he practices this. He has had to be a judge in a particular period to be a judge in the world, and perhaps in Brazil a little bit more so. <laughs> he has to decide in cases, for example, involving not one, not two, but three presidents. The way he has done so, without preference or partisanship, without fear or pomp, is a testament to his integrity and an example of what a judge should be. Not someone that is oblivious to the passions of society around him, but while being aware of those passions, is also not guided by them nor answer before them. Someone that remains the voice of reason and impartiality in the midst of such passions. It is for this reason that is indeed a great honor for us to have you here with us today. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you very much, Gonzalo, too, for the comments that you will make at the end. The floor is yours. Do I have to live up for this introduction? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be here this afternoon and, and to share with you all some ideas and, and some thoughts on this subject, democracy, social media, and freedom of expression. I want to thank the Catholic University for, for the invitation, and I very especially want to thank uh, my good friend, uh, Miguel Maduro, for inviting me and for this exaggerated uh, introduction that you know almost embarrassed me. I, I didn't recognize myself in, in his description. <laughs> And also my good friend, uh, Gonzalo uh, de Almeida Ribeiro, who I met in, in Harvard when he was a brilliant SJD, uh, beginning a wonderful teaching career. It's, it's a pleasure, Gonzalo, to have you here also. So uh, I have divided this presentation in, in three parts. Uh, first part uh, is dedicated to democracy and authoritarian populism. Second part to digital revolution. And the third part to social media and freedom of expression. I want to greet the family of uh, the late Francisco Lucas Pires, who gave, gives uh, the name to, to this uh, lecture. And it's also a pleasure and an honor uh, to have you all here and to be able to participate in an event that honors the memory of uh, Francisco Lucas Pires. So here I start. The first thing I want to say, and uh, Miguel was talking about interpretation. In interpretation always uh, shows the perspective, the view of the interpreter. This is something that modern legal theory uh, identifies. So we interpret according to our point of view according to our background, according to our values, and this is undeniable. I like to illustrate what I'm saying with, a, with an example, with an anecdote. I, I was in Rome before I, I came here, 
And they took me to the Coliseum at night, to visit the Coliseum at night. And that reminded me of a story. Uh, the Brazilian soccer team went to Rome. That was in the 60s. And there was a very famous player, a uh, brilliant player, but not very educated man, who was Mané Garrincha. He was from Ponta Direita. And after the game with the Italian team, they took him for a city tour. And at the end of the city tour, when he got to the hotel, a journalist asked him if he had enjoyed the trip. And he said, I don't know what, why they talk so much about this Coliseum. It's, it's smaller than any, any soccer stadium, and it needs an urgent remodeling. <laughs> so it really depends on how you see things and, and the background that you carry, and that makes a difference. So part one, uh, democracy and authoritarian uh, populism. Constitutional democracy was the prevailing ideology of the 20th century having defeated all the alternatives that disputed with it throughout the century. Communism, fascism, Nazism, military regimes, and religious fundamentalisms. Constitutional democracy, thus the winning ideology of the 20th century, it actually can be seen as a coin with two faces. Democracy on one side, and constitutionalism on the other side. So democracy means, on one face of the coin, popular sovereignty, free elections, and rule of the majority. And on the other side of the coin, democracy means limited power, rule of the law, and protection of fundamental rights. So this is the scenario in which we are gonna be exchanging uh, these ideas here. Yeah. And one thing I wanna add is most constitutional democracies in the world these days also have in their institutional arrangement a Supreme Court or a constitutional court whose mission is, or one of its main missions is to arbitrate the tensions that always exist between democracy, that is the rule of the majority on one hand, the will of the majority on one hand, and the protection of the rule of the law and of fundamental rights on the other hand. So the role of a Supreme Court or of a constitutional court is basically to limit the exercise of power by majoritarian leaders. And one last conceptual note I would like to make. Contemporary democracies are made of votes, rights, and reasons. And what I want to mean by that is that constitutional democracy is not limited to the electoral moment, to the legit legitimacy that comes from the ballots. Democracy is also made by the respect for fundamental rights of everyone, of everyone, and it's also characterized by a permanent public debate that legitimizes the decisions over time. That's why I say votes, rights, and reasons characterize uh, democracy in our days. Uh, although I said that it was the victorious ideology of the 20th uh, century, uh, something seems not to be going so well with democracy these days in many parts of the world in a scenario that is identified by different uh, political scientists as democratic recession, democratic backsliding, uh, authoritarian legalism, abusive constitutionalism, or other uh, derogatory terms. The, these are expressions that have been utilized to identify experiences like the ones that have gone on or are going on in countries like Hungary, Poland, Turkey, uh, the Philippines, Venezuela, 
uh, Nicaragua, and uh, El Salvador. I'm only mentioning the names because this is an academic environment, and uh, of course, I uh, I want to be very uh, precise about it. And even consolidated democracies had problems. I I think I, I should uh, note they had moments of turmoil and disbeliefs in the institutions, as we have seen in the UK with the Brexit and in the United States with the invasion of the capital. So what is happening in the world in this scenario that has been described as democratic uh, recession? And I would say the world is witnessing uh, a, an authoritarian, anti-pluralist and anti-institutional wave and consequently authoritarian wave that poses serious risks to uh, democracy. Populism, authoritarian populism, can be either left-wing or uh, right-wing, but currently in the world, it's right-wing extremism, often uh, xenophobic, homophobic, that has prevailed and has become a matter of concern for Democrats uh, everywhere. The hallmark, I would say, of right-wing populism is the division of society in two groups, we and them. That's a typical uh, populist attitude. When a democracy is always we, never we and them. But the populism uh, playbook divides society in we, or us, the pure, decent, and conservative people, and on the other side, them, the elites, cosmopolitan, corrupt, and liberal. That, that's very typical wherever populism is uh, installed everywhere. There are many causes for what's going on in, in, in the world and for this exploration of resentment in, in many parts of the world. There, there are political causes. The electoral systems do not give voice and relevance to citizenship. They don't feel represented. In many parts of the world, you hear the motto, they don't represent us. So there is a problem with represented, representative uh, democracy. There are social causes in some parts of the world the unemployment rates are very high. In other parts of the world, there is kind of a stagnation and the middle class didn't progress and that generates a resentment. And there is what I like to call an identity cultural cause. In the past decades, there has been the advancement of an agenda of human rights protection, of affirmative action for people of African origins, of environmental protections, of gay rights, of protection of indigenous peoples. And many people felt excluded and mainly felt that they were losing a hegemony that they always thought they had and that they wanted to keep. I like to say that these causes that I just mentioned are not progressive causes. These are the causes of the humankind. These are the causes of humanism. It doesn't belong to a group. It's the cause that everyone should defend, that people are equal and that they deserve respect and uh, concern. A populist authoritarian extremism uh, uses the same strategies all over the world, which are basically three. First one is a direct communication with their supporters and with the masses, usually using social media. Second, as a consequence, the bypass of intermediary institutions like the legislature, like the press, like civil society organization, organizations. And in third place, they usually attack Supreme Courts or constitutional courts as the main representatives of the elites that they need to uh, 
fight. So one thing that's interesting, when I was young and Miguel was younger, uh, Gonzalez is still very young, uh, but when we were all younger, we would talk about the international communism in the world. It was a major international movement on the left. Well, this has changed. And right now, what we see is a far right network around the world and they travel around, they communicate, they have an organic uh, behavior in, in different parts. Uh, the reason why I started with this chapter on democracy and authoritarian uh, populism is because they use as one of their main tools social media and hate speech, disinformation, lies, slanders, and conspiracy theories as their strategy to reach power or to keep uh, power. There are two books that I had the chance to read recently that try to describe how the conservative camp was captured by the far right. One of them is by an Italian author. It's called, in Portuguese, was Engenheiros do Caos, so uh, Caos Engineers, by Giuliano de Empola. And the other one is Twilight of Democracy by Anne Applebaum, which is a, an American journalist. And they try to describe how the far right captured the uh, conservative camp uh, in these days. So all these behaviors, the misinformation campaigns, hate speech, slanders, lies, conspiracy theories, are usually identified by an improper name that became very popular, which is fake, fake news. And fake news have terrible consequences uh, because they undermine democracy and free and fair elections because they deceive the voters, they violate fundamental rights, and they compromise uh, free speech by, and thus tainting the public debate. So this is uh, Miguel Gonzalo, the first part of our three-part conversation about democracy and authoritarian populism. And I'll start the second part, the digital revolution. The world is living under the third industrial revolution. The third is symbolized by the use of steam as a source of energy and it happened in the 18th century. The second industrial revolution is symbolized by the electricity as a source of energy, and it became uh, popular at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. And the third revolution we are living in right now is represented by the massification of personal computers, of smart telephones, and mostly by the internet, connecting billions of people uh, around the, the world. And the digital revolution or technological revolution, which is the third industrial revolution, it has actually revolutionized our lives, the way we live, the way we shop, the way we do research, the way we listen to uh, music. We all have a new vocabulary with words that until the day before yesterday we had never heard that identify utilities and applications without which we wouldn't know how to live anymore. And I made a short list here to share here. First one is Google. So I want to tell the young people here that there has been life on earth without Google, <laughs> terrible as it may sound. And besides that, the new words include Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, WhatsApp, Telegram, Waze for those who used to be lost in the world like myself, uh, Spotify, Netflix, Amazon, 
and for who is single, there is also Tinder. <laughs> so we live this brave new world of information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, neuroscience, 3D printing, quantum computing, internet of things, autonomous cars, you name it. Algorithm is becoming the most important concept of our time. When, once again, Miguel and I were much younger, the most valuable companies were the ones that produce oil, like Exxon and Shell, or car makers like Ford and General Motors, or the major manufacturer of equipments and appliances, which was General Electric. Well, none of them these days figure as the most valuable companies in the world. Now they are Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, with their new names, Meta and, and, and uh, Alphabet. So sometimes we take for granted that we are living, we are in the midst of a major revolution that's going to change our lives with all the benefits it brings, all the benefits. Life is much simpler now. I'm happy that I could be here, but I've been giving talks in different parts of the world from my office at home. And that's, that's something fantastic that we could do. Miguel and I participate in an event every year at Yale that uh, gathers uh, Supreme Court justices from different parts of the world. And during the pandemic, we did it online. So I think that the technological revolution brought many good things and made life easier and better. I'm not like a, I have a good friend that's a retired Supreme Court justice. And he, he likes to tell the story of this guy that went to the doctor and the doctor said, I have bad news for you. I have, I have bad news and I have worse news even. Well, give me the bad ones first. And he said, you only have 24 hours of life. And he goes, what could be worse? I've been meaning to tell you since yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but although there are many good things that came with the digital revolution, there are some major risks that we need to be aware of. And I mentioned a uh, few of them. First, the risks of a world that could come to be dominated by artificial intelligence with the opacity of the algorithms, its discriminatory effects, and most of all, the fear of singularity, which is the machines acquiring consciousness, and then they would run the place, they would take over. This might sound like uh, science fiction, but that's a major concern that most people that work with AI uh, have, or many people. Second risk involves genetic engineering, and it promises to cure many diseases, but the risks of eugenics and the temptation of developing, creating people, creatures that are brighter, more pretty or handsome, and stronger, and then we're gonna play God and increase the inequality in, 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 in the world. And also the risks to privacy with the use of DNA for criminal purposes, facial uh, recognition, and the volume of information that every platform has on all of us. They know where we live, they know who we are married to, they, they know our kids, they know how much money we make, but they also know the last book I purchased online, the last research I did, what are my fears, what are my concerns, but worse than that, and there, there is a new field developing involving neuroscience, the brain science, because what they fear or what they have uh, actually found out is that the platforms, they not only they can discover our preferences for targeting advertisement, but now with neuroscience, it's not that they identify what we want. 
they manipulate what we want. They manipulate our feelings, our fears, and they create the demand for what they want to give us. So at this moment, in different parts of the world, people start to think of a new fundamental right, which is uh, the right to cognitive liberty or mental self-determination or the right to free will. That's scary, but that's the world we, we are living in. So I should add to this complex scenario the abusive use of the internet for illicit, illicit or socially undesirable purposes. And this is the topic we are gonna talk now, our last topic, which is part three, internet, social media, and freedom of expression. The internet also revolutionized the world of social and interpersonal communication. It has exponentially democratized access to information, access to knowledge, and access to the public sphere. It's impossible to exaggerate the impact of the internet in our lives and in, in, in the business of social communication. Before the internet, the dissemination of news, opinions, and uh, facts relied to a great extent on the professional media, professional journal journalism, the traditional media, which are television, radio, and uh, newspapers, the, the printed uh, press. And these means of communication, they would filter the kind of information that would reach the public sphere. So they would have some control, editorial control, on the veracity and civility of what was reaching the public more generally. And what happened with the internet, the emergence of uh, websites and personal blogs, and above all, the emergence of social uh, media, this new means enabled, enabled the dissemination of news, information, ideas, and opinions without any kind of control, editorial control. So now anything can reach the public space, the public sphere, the public square, what includes also, as I've been saying, disinformation, hate speech, consp uh, conspiracy theories, slander, deliberate uh, lying. So there is a positive side with the democratization and there is a negative side. We gave space, we gave room to bad things going online. So one of the uh, most striking developments of the digital revolution is the appearance of social media and messaging uh, apps. And here I, I want to stress, I want to highlight a major change that occurred in our lives. In Brazil, the best selling newspaper is O Globo. And the second best selling newspaper is Folha de São Paulo. They sell approximately 300,000 copies in their digital, digital subscription. 3,100. The New York Times might sell 1 million, maybe 1 million, 1.5 million. Uh, might have 1.5 million subscribers. Well, Facebook has three, 3 billion accounts. YouTube has 2.5 billion accounts. WhatsApp has 2 billion accounts. So the first thing we are talking here is a major change in scale. This is a revolution. Much more people are participating in the public square, in the public debate, which was supposed to be a good thing, except for the distortions that many times 
the internet brings to uh, the public debate. In Brazil, where I live, a survey by, by Congress uh, found out that 79% of the population has WhatsApp as its main source of information. Television, that used to be the queen of my first youth, I mean my third youth now, uh, has only, is only responsible for 50% as a source of information for people uh, broadly. YouTube, 49%, Facebook, 44%, news sites, 38%, and people like me that still read newspapers, only 8% are informed uh, by newspapers. You should see the face that my kids look at me when I have a paper in, in my hands, as, I, as if I were like a, a Jurassic character coming out of some uh, movie. Well, these changes uh, bring some major and to a certain point negative consequences. The first, as I have been saying, uh, the unfiltered circulation of this information. Uh, secondly, and this is very important for whoever is worried about democracy, the second is tribalization of life, meaning people talking only to their tribes, to their groups, forming clusters of people that think alike. And then when you only talk to people that think alike, you radicalize your discourse and you become progressively more intolerant. And that's a major problem that we see in the world, the polarization. But polarization has always existed. It's the way that polarization has been developing that has uh, become a problem. And the appearance of a new concept that is confirmation bias which is an obstacle to good thinking because it only seeks information that matches what one already believes. So you, you only accept the information that corresponds, that matches what you think. And the algorithms in the social media, in the platforms, they select the information and only send you the information you want to see. And so you are always confirming what you already uh, think. And the third, so unfiltered circulation of this information, tribalization of life, and third, there is a crisis in the business model of the professional press. Around the world, major uh, newspapers, hundreds of publication, publications, national and local, have closed their doors or are selling much less and have become almost uh, ir irrelevant. And this is a very important point because the professional press is not only a private business, although it is a private business, but there's also a major public interest involved in, in the press, in the professional press, because the professional press has one of its roles to create a public sphere of common facts that we can all agree. And it's very important that we can agree about the facts, about the objective facts that are happening. After that, people will have different opinions, which is legitimate. But what's happening in the world these days is that people cannot agree on the facts, and everyone has his or her proper narrative to what's going on. And there's no way you can communicate and develop common ground if you're speaking different languages. So this that I have in my pocket, this is a pen. This is a blue pen. This is a fact. After that, one can say, I don't like blue. I prefer black. Or one can say, I, I think you are a Jurassic person having a ball pen in the world of personal computer, or you have an important pen, it makes no sense, whatever. But if someone says that I have a tire in my hands, there's no way we can talk. 
because we are not talking the same language. And this is what is happening in the world. People cannot agree on the same facts. And there is a problem, I think, with the decay of the professional uh, press, is that social media has become very important, but they don't produce news, they don't produce information, they don't pr produce knowledge. They're just the avenues in which news and information and ideas circulate. The ideas are produced by people that publish in the press, people that publish books. So what is happening in, in the world is that the amount of good quality information is decreasing because all the advertising money migrated from the professional press to the digital platforms. So preserving the professional press, plural and with the problems it might have, is very important in my view for democracy so that we can disagree on our ideas and opinions, but we can agree on the facts because I think that's very important. What happened in the world with everything I am describing is that the need for the regulation of the internet appeared. At the beginning of the internet, the belief was that it should be free, open, and unregulated, both in economic, commercial uh, matters, and regarding free speech. And what happened in the world it is that now a consensus has developed that it can't be that way. And we need, unfortunately, to regulate internet in many areas for many reasons. We need to regulate in the economic domain because we need to have fair taxation. We need to protect copyright. We need to apply antitrust legislation to mention, uh, and we need to protect consumers. So it needs to be regulated on an economic level. It also needs to be regulated to protect privacy. Most countries in the world and, and uh, blocks like the uh, European Union have approved legislation to protect privacy because, as I said before, these platforms, these platforms have an incredible amount of data on every one of us. Whoever followed the Cambridge Analytica scandal knows that it was the improper illegal use of private data that allowed for uh, uh, micro-targeting in political campaigns, a dishonest campaign. Because with that information, if you wanted to reach an environmentalist, you would send one type of, of discourse. And you wa if you wanted to reach a farmer, you would have a different discourse. If you wanted to reach a conservative housewife, it was one discourse. If you wanted to reach a feminist, it was a different discourse. So the same candidate with a, a dishonest campaign reaching people with different discourses. That was part of the problem with, with Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal. So uh, we need to regulate to protect privacy and Brazil, Europe, and, and many countries in the world now have legislation protecting privacy and, and imposing consent for the use of this uh, information. And finally, that's the point I wanted to reach, inauthentic behavior, we need to regulate inauthentic behavior. There is a need for some sort of content control and we need rules to establish platform right, uh, liability. Uh, so here lies the most uh, delicate issue, one of the most delicate issues of our time, uh, which is the proper balance between the regulation of social media and of the internet on one hand and protection of free speech on the 
other hand. I uh, would like to stress very briefly the importance of free speech. Uh, most democracies in the world have the protection of free speech in their constitutions. And in many countries, it is treated as a preferred freedom. And it's good that it is. And I defend this idea in Brazil. We have a tradition, unfortunately, of state censorship. And so uh, emphasizing the importance of free speech uh, makes a difference in, in a country like Brazil. And well, Portugal has gone through bad times and dictatorship uh, also. So why is free, free speech treated as a preferred freedom? Uh, because it's a way for the search of the possible truth in a plural world, but recording the history and culture of people. So there's, truth has no owner and there's no objective absolute truth, but seeking, searching uh, the possible truth is one of the goals of free speech. Secondly, it's very important for human dignity so that people can manifest their personality and their relations with, with the world. And third, it's very important for democracy, for the free circulations of ideas, opinions, and uh, facts. So uh, in the digital age, we need to protect free speech, but some of the reasons that legitimize the preferential freedom of free speech now justify the regulation. Truth, human dignity, both very important, and democracy, because the misuse, the abuse of the internet may compromise truth, human dignity, and uh, democracy. And I move on, I'm coming to, to the end, Miguel. Uh, so, what do we need to regulate in social media that deals with free speech includes inauthentic behavior online. What's inauthentic behavior? Is the use of automated systems like bots or fake profiles or repeated profiles or hiring trolls, provocateurs to amplify misinformation, to amplify lies, to amplify slander, to amplify conspiracy theories. And that's the main point of regulating the internet. Because if one person with an account in Facebook, for example, says, writes a post saying, kerosene oil is good to fight COVID-19, and he has 20 followers, that's bad. But the harm it can do is limited. But if that post is amplified and reaches thousands of people, then you have a public health issue. So the reason why we need to fight on inauthentic behavior is that it's used to amplify lies to amplify misinformation and deceive the population. And many times it's used to drown out information that you don't want to come out. So there are some bad news that you want, don't want people to pay attention. You create some fake news and you amplify that as much as you can. And the truth that you don't want to appear will be hidden, will be flooded by the lies you were able to make reach the, the public uh, sphere. Second, we need to regulate for illegal content. You cannot use the internet for uh, child sexu sexual abuse or for terrorism or for the sale of arms or, or, or drugs or whatever. And we also need to fight disinformation, uh, which consists of deliberate lying and creating false perceptions and destroying uh, democracy and, and the public debate. There are three important observations I, I wanna make here. 
unlike what happened before when the traditional media was in charge, and at that time, it was very difficult to reach the public sphere. There was a, a scarcity of information. In the world we live now, there is such an abundance of information that what is lacking is attention. What is difficult is to catch the attention of the reader. Anyone can uh, post something in Facebook and potentially reach three billion people. But there are three billion people posting messages. So what's really difficult to get is attention. That's the first observation. The second observation goes against the human condition, Miguel and Gonzalo, sadly, which is, according to studies, false, defamatory, and sensa sensationalist content that sparks anger and hatred produce much more engagement than factual, moderate, and rational publications. And the third consequence from the two first ones is that these facts provide the platforms with the wrong incentives. And they have a natural business tendency of amplifying what sparks anger or hatred or lies or sensation, sensationalism because the way they are paid by advertisers is by the number of clicks, by the amount of accesses. And if bad journalism or bad news uh, bring more engagement, that brings more income. And so you have the wrong uh, incentive and that is also a problem. Uh, there were a few more things I, I would like to say. One thing that we don't want to do is to replace state censorship with private censorship by the platforms. So here again, there is a proper balance to be reached. And the way I see it, I think that we need when platforms are moderating content and moderating mean means the power of banning something, the power of, power of amplifying something, or reducing the scope of something, or tagging something by stamping warnings of the risk of what's being said. So uh, I think content uh, moderation by the platforms uh, needs to have transparency, meaning clear terms of use and clear criterion to ban things, for example, due process, the whoever is banned or has a post removed needs to be notified and needs to have the reason why it was done. Oh, they, I'll, I'll, I'll be very objective, but ob objectively, but you should know the reason why your post you, was uh, removed. And they, they must have fairness, meaning they can't remove posts because they don't like women or don't like gays or don't like uh, Afro uh, ascendancy. Those are unacceptable elements of discrimination. So fairness, transparency, due process, and uh, fairness are uh, required. But one thing that's important, taking into account the amount of posts, we're talking about millions, maybe billions of posts every day. So there's no way you can control that unless you use algorithms. Now they are back. And the algorithms make mistakes. Two of the most egregious mistakes were a, uh, a breast cancer campaign was removed as pornography. And that very famous picture of a girl fleeing a napalm attack in Vietnam was removed as uh, pedophilia, as uh, child abuse. So uh, algorithms make mistakes, but there's no way the platform, the platform can control uh, everything that's on. There are two uh, main models of liability for the platforms. The one that is used in Europe and the one that we use in Brazil. In Europe, the platform is liable if after a extrajudicial notification 
they don't remove content. In Brazil, the law provides that you need to remove after the first judicial order. So the private communication, except in the case of revenge porn, of sharing of private images. In the other cases, you need a judicial order uh, in the line that platforms should not be a private uh, censor. So uh, I would add and finish. We're talking about legislation and what the state and the platforms can and must do. But it's very important to highlight that the efforts of the platforms and of authorities won't be enough to create a healthy public uh, sphere without media education and awareness by society. As any other kind of criminality, people need to be aware and conscious of what's right and of what's wrong, as we do with crime in general. We don't have a policeman after each person for this person behave at, uh, properly. People behave properly because they are aware, they have values, they have ethical limits. So we need media education and society's awareness so that people won't pass on what is a lie, what is a conspiracy theories and etc. So my final take of what I've said in, in three ideas uh, basically is the digital revolution made the world better and more democratic, uh, facilitating access to information, knowledge, and to the public sphere by people in, in general, and that's very important. But we must know that this access can be used and sometimes is used to violate fundamental rights or to uh, attack democracy. That's one. Second, uh, because of this, uh, we need to confront inauthentic uh, behavior and illegitimate con content. That's inevitable. But we need to be very cautious to do it with proportionality and adequate procedures. And there's no way the internet will be a constructive, positive environment without media education and society awareness. That's the only way we can make these new technologies tools to make a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so, you very much. Should I use the microphone? Sure. I, uh, sure. I imagine it's, it's heavy. It depends on what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's getting pretty late. It's getting pretty late. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here and to perform this um, supporting role in Luis Roberto's lecture for a number of reasons. And um, I'm going to list the reasons because I think they're worth listing. Um, reason number one is that Catholic is, of course, my school. I'm a member of the faculty. I've been on leave for a few years as a judge of the Constitutional Court, but I have tried every year to be um, as, as much as I can an active participant in the school's institutional life and most importantly to keep teaching my students, which is something that I very much like to do and that I feel um, no longer contractually bound to do, but um, ethically bound to do. Reason number two is that Miguel was my teacher many years ago and surely responsible for many of my limitations as a lawyer, <laughs> as a jurist, um, and also in many ways a mentor, as he very well uh, knows. And I, it's a um, great pleasure to be a discussant for this particularly significant moment in the global school's institutional life as uh, Miguel um, started his journey as the dean of the global school. Reason number three is that, as Luis Roberto mentioned, we, we met uh, quite a few years ago. 
when I was a lot younger, uh, and you were a bit younger yourself, oh, yeah. although people <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't easily know these stats. And um, uh, I was at the time a doctoral student in the United States, and Luis Roberto was a visiting scholar, a man of great status. I had a number of Brazilian students who told me that a demi god has just arrived <laughs> in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His name is Barroso, as he's known in, as he was known in Brazil. Of course, now he's known as Ministro yeah. Barroso, but Barroso came. He's a super lawyer and constitutional scholar. And then I met this um, incredibly cultured, gentle, charismatic, accessible person who took me out for lunch. I was at the time uh, giving a short seminar in which would come to the sessions of my seminar and be an active participant. And what a lovely person he is. And I was incredibly happy when you made it to the Supreme Court of Brazil because I'm, I'm, I knew that you would make the institution um, even a lot better than it was then. And the final reason um, is that we're here in the presence of the family of Francisco Cuspi. I did not have the pleasure of um, uh, getting personally acquainted with Francisco Cuspi because, of course, he died many years before. I was uh, sufficiently wise to engage with his work. But something that I'm not sure I ever told you, any of you with the exception of Martin is that I'm a great admirer of the, particularly the scholarship of uh, Lucas Pires. To my mind, of a remarkable generation of Portuguese constitutional scholars, in some ways the first generation, because this was the first generation of uh, constitutional scholars who engaged with Portugal as a democratic country subject to the rule of law uh, to its full extent. And he was, to my mind, uh, the most creative spirit of that generation, a man of great um, uh, intellectual ability and very unique in the context of the Portuguese legal academia. So these are the reasons why I'm very happy to be here. Now I'll say a little bit more about the substance of Luis Roberto's lecture. And um, as I'm sure you've noticed, he's a person, this was no surprise to me, of an extensive knowledge veering uh, way beyond uh, what we would um, think of his uh, area of expertise or academic expertise. I'm going to be slightly more careful and I'm going to um, focus on what I think is one of the main and most significant claims in his lecture. And the claim is that um, if we think about the regulation of free speech in the age of the internet and the social media, and particularly what legislatures can do to regulate free speech and control some of the hazards or limit some of the harms that he mentioned, uh, we might want to take a careful look at the value served by free speech or the reasons for us to hold free speech in such high regard and finding those reasons perhaps relevant arguments not only to maintain our allegiance to free speech as a fundamental right of particular transcendence, but also to find some limited but significant room for restrictions or limitations to free speech in this brave new world that is quite different from, say, the world that uh, John Stuart Mill was assuming when he wrote the famous chapter two of On Liberty with that remarkable case for um, untrammeled or nearly unlimited free speech. And um, of course, free speech is a right. Um, lawyers have been, particularly legal academics, have been discussing for about 250 years what a right is, and they have reached no consensus um, on that. But we have some um, basic notion of what a right is that is of service to us as we try to figure out what are the reasons or grounds or values um, uh, underpinning uh, freedom of speech as a fundamental right. We think of a right when uh, someone, a right holder, is owed a duty. That duty is addressed to that person, which means that there are sufficient reasons to hold someone under a duty towards someone else. Now, I would like to stress two aspects of this very simple, accessible definition of a right. One is that um, the reasons for us to hold someone to be under a duty with respect to someone else that is a duty directed to an agent, and thereby that agent having a right correlated to a duty, are not necessarily reasons that have to do with the welfare, well-being, or interests of the right holder. Let me give you a couple of uh, pretty bizarre examples. The first is that the statute of the constitutional court gives me a right, which I've never exercised, to um, bear and use firearms. And I'm sure that the this is a very old right, because it's a right that comes from the um, statute uh, of um, judicial magistrates, and uh, I imagine it has at, at least 200 years old. 
And uh, the rationale for this right, I suppose, is some notion that if the executive, which controls the means of violence, the army and the police, decides at some point to deploy violence against the judiciary, heroic judges like me will take up <laughs> arms to defend the republic against tyranny. So this is a rationale for this right. It's a right that I have, but obviously the reasons for the government in particular, but third parties to be under a duty not to interfere with my rights to we'll go back home use and bear. Today, a little bit more uneasy. Okay, that's right, that's right, that's right. I think I do well not to exercise this particular right, but the reasons uh, for me to have this right have nothing to do with my own interests, but of course with the public interest. This is a bizarre example, but other examples are far more accessible. For example, um, some of you are practicing lawyers. There's something called attorney-client privilege, which is an important right that lawyers have in their professional capacity. This right is established in the interests of the justice system, and particularly of the clients of lawyers, not of lawyers themselves. Journalists have a right not to reveal their sources, for example, and this is also a right that they have by virtue of interests that are of a public nature, particularly the interest in the free flow and access by experts, professionals to information. But of course, many rights, particularly what we call human rights, are essentially based on reasons pertaining or sourced in the right holder himself or herself. This is certainly true of the right not to be tortured, the right not to be enslaved, um, uh, the right to life, the right to bodily integrity, so on and so forth. Now, these reasons don't necessarily have to be interests. They can be um, uh, reasons of a different nature. It could be directly, for example, human dignity. One example that I like to give my students, because I teach a course on fundamental rights, and um, I, I apologize for giving these trivial examples, is when I tell them that my interest in life is exactly the same in the following two hypotheticals that are famous in moral philosophy. One is this, I'm a doctor, I have uh, five patients who need urgent transplants of different vital organs. And it turns out that there is a perfectly healthy young man that has just entered my practice. And I could kill this young man, harvest the organs, and save the other five. And everyone agrees that this would be morally abhorrent and completely unacceptable, right? The other case is a case in which I'm a driver of a trolley on a track. And this trolley, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the brakes don't work, and the trolley is heading towards five workmen that are working on the track. They're unaware of this and there's nothing I can do to warn them. If I pull a switch on the trolley, the trolley will change course and it will head towards a single individual. Now, not everyone agrees on this hypothetical, but most people think that it is morally acceptable to pull the switch. Now, the interest of the individual in both cases is exactly the same. It's the interest in living, but we have a strong intuition that the way to proceed in these two cases from, of course, a moral and a legal standpoint is quite different. And that's because to use a human being as simply a means or an instrument for the sake of other people is something that is in itself morally wrong. Now, this is a dignitarian reason, has nothing to do with human or individual welfare. Now, many rights are ordinary rights. They are rights that emerge from banal things like uh, private transactions, from administrative ordinances, from legislation. Sometimes they are created by judges. For example, the United States Supreme Court, in a famous case that you may have heard about recently, Roe versus Wade, decided that on the basis of some majestic generalities, there is a fundamental right of a woman to abort in the first 24 weeks. And the current composition of the United States Supreme Court very dramatically said that this is wrong, there is no such right. But in any case, these are rights um, that have been created according to relatively established procedures of a legal system. But we hold some rights to be fundamental rights. And usually those rights are incorporated in um, declarations of rights, human rights treaties, and particularly for what interests us here, constitutions. And these rights are held to be fundamental because we have come to a relatively broad consensus that when the reasons underlying these rights, and to make things easier, let's think of these reasons as interests, that they are touched upon, that they are limited, restricted, affected in some negative manner, that alarm bells go off, and that something might be wrong, because there's a strong presumption that affecting those interests will reflect some misjudgment about the significance of the reasons to hold um, 
the government, of course, and people in general to be under a duty to respect um, that right. And this is what we think um, um, uh, of when we talk about freedom of speech. Now, people think that they know what they're talking about when they talk about freedom of speech, but in fact, it's, it's a lot more complicated than it seems. For example, we speak about free speech. There's um, a famous legal theorist of the 90s who was formerly a literary theorist, Stanley Fish, who wrote a book, collection of essays called There is no such thing as free speech and it's a good thing too. And uh, he draws a distinction between free speech and freedom of speech, which is a right. And uh, one thing that he says that is fairly obvious and that most people don't notice is that speech in itself is not a good. Speech is an instrumental good. Um, if we lived in heaven and all our needs were met on the spot, we were invulnerable and we would partake of the absolute goodness of God, we would not need freedom of speech at all. I mean, we would speak perhaps in the same way in which my nine-year-old daughter, who obviously can speak, she started recently to giggle and to, and to laugh and to engage by means of noise. Um, but that is the relationship between the use of our expressive abilities and um, our action in a realm as far removed from our world as heaven. And, and this would be the case because we would need to use speech for what is ordinarily the reason to use speech, which is that speech is an extension of our ability to act. We use speech to command, to plead, to request, uh, to solicit, um, to transact, and of course to express or convey ideas, opinions, arguments, so on and so forth. Um, legal theorists have a tendency to think that and when they think about free speech, that the world is like a gigantic academic seminar room, which is obviously not the case. I mean, most people speak not to engage in argument. That is, in order to elicit from other people a response with the purpose of moving towards greater enlightenment or persuading the other of an argument, they use speech for trivial reasons because they want something. Um, that's, the, that's the reason to... Uh, to speak. And this is exactly why, uh, going back to my heaven or paradise example, this is exactly why, for example, when we are in a religious ceremony, uh, we use our vocal abilities, but we do such things as praying and singing, and we do so as um, in unison, as a group, collectively, because the point is that uh, if we partake in some absolute truth, we don't need a conversation. We only need a celebration. It's something entirely different. In our world, however, we use speech as an extension of our ability to act. And this is the primary, most immediate reason why freedom of speech is something of value. Because if we're deprived from speech, we're deprived of something akin from, of um, our ability to act, to move, um, to have... Um, uh, freedom of bodily movement. It's something that diminishes very significantly our powers of action. A second reason, which is very different, why we hold freedom of speech in high regard, I'm sorry, but I'm feeling very hot, so I'm going to use this as <laughs> an, a surrogate of an aircon. A second reason why we hold freedom of speech in high regard, which is quite different, it's because we tend to think of speech as potentially a lot less harmful than action. So I said that speech is useful as a surrogate of action, but then speech is also potentially much less harmful for action than action for reasons that are quite obvious and I think um, accessible to everyone. If I kick someone's leg and I break someone's leg, this is irreversible. The leg can be cured, the fitness can be restored, but something happened which is irreversible. This is not true of speech. If I give an opinion, if I express some view, if I request something, in principle, this is not an event that leaves a marking. It could leave a marking. I could incite people to um, use violence against other people, but there's a gap between the use of speech always and the realm of action, the realm of material fact. So another reason why we hold speech in high regard is because we think that if speech is being restricted, it might be for a better reason because the primary reason for us to restrict freedom of action in its various guises, which is to protect people from harm, is not applicable to its full extent when it comes to speech. A, a third reason, which is at the heart of uh, John Stuart Mill's famous argument for freedom of speech, is that we need speech in order to 
move closer to truth and to correct falsehood. So Mill makes this argument, which is very simple and elegant. At the same time, he says that when you say something, however outrageous people feel about what you say, there are only three options. What you say is true, what you say is untrue, or what you say is a mix of truth and falsehood. And Mill says that it's always a benefit for people to listen to you. Um, it's a benefit if it's true for obvious reasons, because it will enable people to correct falsehood, their mistaken beliefs. Uh, if it's false, it's also useful, because it will corroborate people's conviction in the truth of their opinions, or at least will eliminate some alternative to their opinions. And if it's a mix, it's well, uh, it's, um, there's good reasons for people to listen to what you have to say, because it's a mix of the two previous cases. This is Mill's argument for um, freedom of speech. So we, if we don't know what the truth is, we need speech as an instrument in order to pursue, to engage on a quest for truth. And the final reason is that, and this is fairly obvious, there is no democracy without free speech. Um, one of the greatest um, uh, legal theories of the 20th century, and I think a great hero for Louis Robert, Ronald Dworkin, made this uh, argument about the connection between free speech and democracy that I think is a very powerful argument. He says that if we want laws that reasonably divide the community, laws that have been voted by, for example, representatives elected by a majority, to be acceptable to a minority of dissenters, then we need to make sure that each and every individual has an opinion on the issue, has had at least the potential for expressing that opinion and try to persuade his and her fellow citizens in the public space. For that, you need a lot more than freedom of speech because a public space is something that depends on a number of institutional features that go beyond uh, the right to free speech. But obviously, free speech is a necessary condition for this to happen. So these are the reasons for free speech to be um, such an important um, right, a right that we hold in high regard that we conceive as a fundamental right. These reasons are not overlapping. The case for free speech based on its instrumental value to individuals as an extension to their action is much broader because free speech then is an interest akin to my interest in doing whatever I wish. Uh, for example, there's a famous case decided by the German Federal Constitutional Court about this bizarre episode in which a man rode a horse in some um, pathway in the forest, in the black forest in Germany, and then decided to sue the government when he was kicked out of the forest for violating a regulation that said you can't ride a horse in the pathway and said that I have a fundamental right to um, freedom of movement in the forest and I can do whatever I wish. And the German Constitutional Court said, um, I, I think, maybe mistakenly, but said, you do have such a right, but of course that right is not sufficiently important to defeat the reasons that inform the regulation. But the point is that we have an interest in doing as we wish. And um, this is true of speech as an extension of action. But that doesn't mean that every instance of speech is of value for the other reasons I listed. For example, why is it that in the case law, of most Supreme and Constitutional Courts. This is true of the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court of Brazil, the Constitutional Court of Germany, the Portuguese Constitutional Court. We hold political speech to be a much more sensitive area than um, private speech or commercial speech, which has a distinguished status on its own. Well, it's because when it comes to political speech, all these reasons that I have listed, they come together, they coalesce, and they form a particularly strong case. Now, why is this important? Because in ordinary life, we often act according to rules, and, and rights are, in a way, rules. I mean, if, unless we talk about the very specific right that I have under an agreement with Miguel, most rights that we have are rights that other people have as well, by virtue of general legislation or general regulation or a constitution or universally, if we're talking about universal human rights. So rights tend to be general. Um, they, they, they are attributed to categories of people and perhaps to everyone who is um, a person. And we can do lots of things with rights reasonably, intelligently, without knowing exactly what rights are grounded in 
what justifies those rights. And this is true of rules as well. We follow all sorts of rules in our ordinary lives without even thinking about the rationale of those rules. Sometimes you wake up and we think, well, this is a very stupid rule and I'm going to revise my attachment to this rule if this is a non-mandatory rule. But in most cases, we engage with rules and we apply them without really knowing what are the reasons underpinning them. And this is essential for us to act as ordinary people who don't have to exercise reflective judgment in each and every instance of our practical lives, which would make our lives obviously miserable. And this is true of fundamental rights as well. But when it comes to a critical age, like the age in which we live, in which we can no longer be complacent about the way in which we should understand the strength of a particular right, its scope or its reach, that's the case of freedom of speech, then we really need to move beyond the right to its underlying uh, reasons which is what I try to do, of course, very briefly with this exercise about the justification for freedom of speech. And this is the right method to approach these challenging questions that are posed to freedom of speech and its potential limitations. Questions such as, can the government regulate and how fake news? Uh, can the government regulate and how so-called hate speech? Um, is, um, uh, are things such as, for example, um, pornography, uh, free, free speech, as the United States Supreme Court has often said, or is it something entirely different from speech? And we need to engage with these reasons in order to understand if by um, regulating speech in these areas, we are first genuinely limiting free speech, and if we're limiting free speech, if that limitation is justified or not. I'm just going to give I don't have a blueprint for this. I think these are very complicated questions. But I'm going to give just a few hints of what I think, very quickly, of what I think are legitimate inroads of general legislation in the area of free speech in the, um, in the era of um, the internet and particularly social networks. The first is that, yes, there is room for regulating what is called fake news. Um, but this is a particularly slippery area because most people who exercise free speech, they believe strongly in what they're saying. It's a mistake to assume that because something is obvious to you, that it is obvious to whoever is saying the opposite. I'm going to give you an example. It is clear to me that anyone who thinks that the Russian invasion of Ukraine was driven by an actual fear of the expansion of NATO and with a strong belief that the geopolitical survival of Russia is at stake is a moron. That is my view. But other people in good faith sincerely believe that I am a moron who has succumbed to American ideology by believing otherwise, right? So the only safe test for what we now call fake news is a good old test that we apply in the law of defamation. It is just a case that this phenomenon is now much more wide-reaching and dangerous. And the test is when people deliberately um, speak falsehoods, they spread falsehoods, or, which is close to this test of intention, when they make no effort whatsoever in spreading information to assess the truthfulness of the information they are spreading if they are in a position of institutional responsibility with respect to that information. So this with respect to fake news. The other example is hate speech, which I think is equally problematic because again, um, we can think of someone who expresses racism and bigotry as being driven by hate and having as a purpose to offend other people. But those people, as crazy as it may sound, most of them, and there are studies who document this, they are acting in good faith. I mean, there are really people who believe that there is a worldwide Jewish conspiracy, that there are fundamental differences between races that have to be taken into account if we want to have cohesive society, so on and so forth. If we don't want to censor these opinions, we need to be very careful with the way in which we regulate um, something like hate speech. And how can we do that? Well, one test, of course, is when hate speech is what Jeremy Waldron called group libel. That is, we offend not an individual, we offend a group. 
much in the same way in which I can libel someone by using speech with the sole aim of causing pain to that person. Um, I can do the same if I attack a particular, a particular group in a vicious way, and if I can show that this attack is driven by nothing but a desire to discriminate, exclude, and assault the dignity of the other, then this would meet the test that I'm talking about. I'm going to finish <coughs> now uh, with a final example. Another thing is that we have to look at not only the content of speech, but the media of speech. There's a difference between write me writing a newspaper article in which I defend a proposition that many people may find disgusting and that goes against mainstream views. And me, for example, posting on some very public space, let's say the wall of a, universal, uh, of a university, some racial slur in which I say something like, we need to get rid of Muslims because they are terrorists or at least are complicit with terrorism. There's a big difference between making an argument as preposterous as it may sound to us in a newspaper article and posting something on a wall. So these are the inroads for, I think, a regulation of free speech that is compatible with the fact that we hold free speech in high regard and we take it to be one of the most fundamental rights uh, in our constitutional tradition. Thank you.